We are at four after. Let's officially get started. Welcome to another uh, weekly installment of Mealworms and More. My name is Justin Meyer. I own and run Midwest Mealworms here in central Missouri. I'm an admin in the Facebook Mealworm Farming Facebook co-op group and just here to get the community together, do some chatting about mealworms. If you have questions, comments, concerns, something going wrong in your farm, something going well, I like to hear the stories that are working too, as does everybody else, but we're here to learn and help each other. So uh, get those questions rolling, throw them down there, and I am mobile today again as well. I'm actually out in the front part of the farm, so you can probably hear the insects out there. It's a gorgeous day, and so I wanted to come out here and sit rather than being in the office. So let's see. Hey, Lynn, welcome, welcome. Good to see you again. Da, da. Yeah, I was like, yeah, you can, you know, if, if you guys have questions, you can always direct send them to me if you want. Direct message on Facebook, Messenger, that's totally fine. Put them in comments on the event, that might work. Um, and that way they can they can get tackled. All right, hey, Caitlin, welcome, welcome. Good to see you again. If you guys ask any questions or comments and it seems like I'm just completely ignoring you, please send me a direct message on Facebook. Sometimes I don't get to see everything here via the scrolling or they're just not shown for some reason. So tag me or send me a, a direct message to help get it, get it up into the queue here for me to take a look at. I do have a hard stop at the top of the hour, which for me is gonna be three o'clock central. So we still have quite a bit of time to go. Belazar, welcome. Welcome back. I do have a hard stop though, so we're gonna have to, to end things. If I could go over, I would. Recording will be available. Once everything gets squared away by Facebook, they'll review it and then post it to the group. So if you have any questions that don't get answered, definitely go ahead and put, the, put them in comments here. If they don't get answered, I'll go through afterwards and make sure everything does get squared away. Facebook is not populating the comments, so just, you know, I'll play with it and see if I can find a fix. Okay. I can see your comments okay. So I can see, well, I say that after I just said, tell me if I don't see your comments, but I'm, I'm seeing everything populate here. So I don't know if, if there's a, something going on overall with Facebook or what, but if you guys have any questions, go ahead and throw them down there and we can tackle them. If you wanna see anything in the farm, either in the front part here or back in the insect room, nobody's been in there today for a while. I did some prep on some of the harvested worms that we collected yesterday, then got those knocked out. And then I collected some superworm beetles and what else did I do in there? Oh, I gave everybody moisture. So everybody got a drink. Water gel crystals are in there and sprayed some moisture. I did start spraying moisture again recently. I think that was a couple weeks ago. I mentioned that and that seems to be going, going okay. I haven't had any issues. Sue, so, I see 14 comments, but only four are visible. Yeah, that's interesting. I started, I started noticing that on what was it, my Facebook posts? It would say that there were comments, but when I went and looked at them, they weren't, they weren't there. And I, I even looked for the hidden ones. Like, I don't know if Facebook's filtering or if maybe somebody commented and they block comments from elsewhere. I'm, I'm not sure, but I can, I can see them. Yeah, it looks like if 14 is a good estimate of what I see here as I scroll. So I'm, I'm able to see, and I'll, I'll read everything off as, as we go, like normal. Shannon. My first beetles are now two weeks old, and I'm wondering if I'm supposed to move them to a new bin now or let them wait another week or two. Thanks. Totally depends on what your end goal is and if you have the available space. So we do beetle swap here every week, but then we, we ran in the old farm, which was a, quite a bit smaller than the existing building we're in now. I did it every two weeks, and it was just based on space and availability, because every time you change those trays, Shannon, you're going to take those beetles and you're going to... Oh man, the flies are getting me. You're gonna take those beetles, you're going to pull them out, put the substrate, egg laden substrate back in that tray, set that one aside, and then you're gonna start a new tray. So you've now added a tray to your system. If you have the space, you know, we we wanna to try to cull those beetles after two, depending on your environment, but after two to two and a half months, your egg production is gonna plummet, right? And so if you swap every two weeks for those two, two and a half months, you're gonna have, that's eight to 10 weeks, if you do that every two weeks, you're gonna have four to five trays along with your beetle tray. If you do that beetle swap every week, you're gonna have eight to nine to 10 trays, depending on how long you keep your beetles. So if you have tray availability, I like to do it more frequently. So we we switch to every week here. And what that does is it gives your trays more balance from a size perspective as those mealworms are gonna grow. So if you have a tray that beetles lay in for 14 days, on day one of that tray, beetle lays an egg and then on day 14, a beetle lays an egg and you swap that tray, 
those two larvae are going to be very different size, very different sizes, right? That first one's had an extra 14 day jump on that other one. And that's really noticeable towards the end of their growth. You're gonna see those big ones just absolutely go bonkers. There's nothing wrong with it though. It works, we did it for several years, but by shrinking that timeline down, by increasing the number of beetle swaps you do, you're making those more equivalent from an age perspective. So you have the space, just wasn't sure if they're laying eggs yet. They will start laying their eggs. Thank you for that qualification, that's perfect info. They will start laying their eggs as soon as they get to that black phase. So when they hatch, they're white, kind of kind of like a, a mealworm larva when it goes through an instar, when it sheds its exoskeleton, it gets white. It's al an albino mealworm. The beetle will emerge white, and then it'll start to darken up. It'll turn like a reddish hue, a brownish hue, dark brown, and then get to black. And as soon as that puppy gets to black, it is reproducing. So it's very likely you have eggs in that tray, and I, I'd go ahead, it's been two weeks, I'd go ahead and do it. Da, da, da. All right, let's see. Let's see, Convictus. Can mealworms be a pest if they escape? I use them to feed wild birds. They can. Mealworms are actually very well known by poultry farmers as a pest because they get into the crevices, the nooks and crannies. The poultry love them because it's extra snacks that they can find. But mealworms, they'll actually eat into insulation. And so the poultry farmers don't really like it because they need that insulation to help keep their flock temperature regulated, right? But it's very possible that if mealworms escape in bulk, like there's gonna have to be a lot of them uh, that get out and have the right condition, the right moisture and the right things to eat, and then they will, they could reproduce. It's unlikely, you have to have the right climate. We have in mid-Missouri, like if I put some out right now, it's likely that they would survive, but because it's such a small population, it's not gonna do very well, and it's highly likely that they're just gonna be gobbled up and they're not be able to establish because they're out in the open and they'll go pretty quick. But it's definitely possible. If you're inside of a house or a home, those are the same thing. If you're inside of a living dwelling, you do wanna be mindful of you know anything that might get onto the floor while you're processing and you wanna make sure you're keeping your trays, the sides clean so they can't, mealworms and, and beetle, the, the larva and the beetle, they can climb plastic if it's dirty or scratched. Okay, so keep those, those sides clean. You'll see them get dusty over time. They're gonna get messy. Make sure you do a, a clean out at some point. Ooh, I need to add that to the, to the guide that I'm writing. That's, that'll be a good one. And so make sure those are clean and then they won't escape and they'll be in that bin. Really good question. Da, da, da. Thank you, Invictus. Thank you, thank you. I, I dig that name. I hear like running water, buzz. Yes, it's the insects from right out here. If it's too big of a bother, I can go back into the office. No worries there, just let me know. Makes a lot of sense. Good response there, Velazar. Thank you, thank you. There's also a problem trying to separate such tiny worm shannon because both frass. Oh, this goes to the question earlier about the swapping and the size variation. You're gonna separate tiny worms because both frass and worms fall through the 30 mesh sifter. I wait until they are closer to half inch long and there's significant frass more before I sift the egg bins. Correct, so Sue, are you saying you sift your your mealworm bins, right? So you're gonna, like every week or two, you do a beetle swap, you sift out the beetles, put all that substrate back into that bin and move it into the, you know, into a stack and let it start growing. And then you put your beetles into a fresh tray. That stack, as those beetles start to, or beetles, as those larvae start to grow, um, one of the things you wanna be mindful of is that if you sift it too soon, and this is where, where I think Sue's headed, if you, if you sift it too soon, those baby mealworms are going to go through your sifter and you're gonna lose them. So a little bit of frass is okay. You don't wanna have, you know, inches deep of anything. I try to stay about an inch and a half total depth of frass and bran, and I try to keep that frass quantity lower. It's rare that we get that deep though, because as they start eating the bran, frass is, is less volume. And so the bran will get eaten, the level will go down, the frass will build up on the bottom. It's not gonna hurt anything. Let them grow for like four or five weeks, depending on your environment, but give them at least four or five weeks before you try to sift anything. You don't really need to. I guess from my perspective, I've had good success with just leaving them in that bin. And then once they're ready to harvest the big ones, we'll harvest the big ones, sift out the frass, and then the smaller ones are big enough, they haven't gone through the mesh, and then we take those and put them, we'll weigh them out, put them into a bin, add some fresh substrate, and then put them back in the colony to keep growing. So right, can we speak to ideal temperatures for beetles and mealworm? As far as I know, both needs different environments. Yes, I'm trying to remember, 
I can't recall what the beetle temperature, and I don't want to make, make a guess here and be wrong. I do know that you can vary the temperatures and get different results, right? There's different temperatures that are better for the different stages. And it's something that is probably a next level type scenario. And what I mean by that is we've got an entire building, well, half of our building, dedicated to 78 degrees Fahrenheit and 70% moisture. The reason that I'm not worried about trying to have different temperatures or building different zones is for just from an efficiency perspective, and it's another variable that I need to keep track of. And so we haven't uh, totally adjusted yet to the new farm. We're only three, are we three months in now, I think, after moving insects in? And so I'd like to go through an entire year of weather to get the ups and downs to make sure that we've got you know, all the air conditioning power that we need, the heating that we need, et cetera, before I start messing around with anything too specific. But that's a good one, Belazar. That'll be something I'll try to do some research on because I feel like I've heard that you can do different temperatures to try to have more efficient results. And the way, like once we get some info on that, you know, depending on if something needs a higher temperature versus a lower temperature, you know, put those on top. So, you know, if, if for example, if the beetles need higher temperature, put the beetles on top of whatever it is or wherever you're raising them because heat rises, right? Or vice versa, if the mealworms need it, move them up top. But that's a good one. I'll, I'll do some research on that because I don't remember the exact answer. For ass in my, Sue, for ass in my bins is usually about three-eighths of an inch by the time I sift the trays of baby mealworms. That's a good, good number. Ta -ta. Trina, hey, good to see you. Have you experimented with how to get larger mealworms, i.e. less crowded, more crowded? Not yet. There is potential for that to be worthwhile. I would, I'd probably want to see a bit more data from someone before I tried to do that. And the only reason I say that is because right now I am maxed out from a tray perspective and I just don't have the available trays to try to play. It's actually pretty frustrating right now that I can't do some experimentations that I want to do, but there is some probable data that could be you know, gathered if you put less. I do know that when they're smaller, you want to have more volume. You want to have more quantity, right? Because when they're smaller, they'll, they'll rub against each other, they'll help generate heat, but they also grow better. There was a study that was released that showed the, the younger babies grow faster. And then they hit a certain age, and then you separate them out uh, so that they don't build up too much heat, they don't get overcrowded because now they're bigger, and you separate those into the different trays and then raise them. So theoretically, if they're bigger, like once they get to that next, next level, you could separate them again and see if that extra room allowed them to grow without the stress of overcrowding, you know, potentially pupating them and getting them to just be larger in general. I think if somebody wanted to go down the path of doing that, I think you'd also have to look into the labor involved in actually doing that split out. Is it beneficial to, to do that? Do people really want much bigger mealworms, that sort of thing. I haven't had a big demand on my end, in my experience, for people wanting bigger mealworms than what I provide because the, the folks that usually want the bigger ones are the folks that are fishing, and so they want to be able to put it on a hook, and bigger mealworms are easier. So the, the way that I see that happening, for the most part, is folks will apply a copious amount of the juvenile hormone. It's a natural hormone, but it's applied in amounts that aren't natural, so that it, it basically forces the mealworm to not be able to pupate, and then it'll just keep growing. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's a lot of times that's how things, the, the larger mealworms are produced and, and sold. But there's nothing wrong with that if you're okay with it have at it. I don't introduce any of those chemicals in here, and so I haven't gotten huge, huge, huge mealworms. But we get regular size mealworms. Let's see. That was a really good question, Trina. Oh, I'm going to I'm gonna stick here with, with Trina's question. There's a, a, a follow-up comment and a response to Trina. I picked up a thousand mealworms locally, and they were large and gorgeous. I'm so impressed. I asked him about them, and he didn't use any chemicals. How did he do it? That would be the, que the next question, right? If he didn't do it with chemicals, how did he? Let's see, Velazar. Less is bigger, 60-40 cylinder tray up to one kilogram. Ray larva is bigger when the... Whoop! This scrolling is terrible. Ray larva is bigger than the 1.5 kilogram larva in the same tray. Less is bigger. I'm not, I'm not following. Well, less is bigger. 60, 40 centimeter tray. So that's the that's the blue size tray dimensions. Those are you using the blue trays from Beacon Camp? I can't remember. One kilogram ready larva is bigger and then one and a half larva in the same tray. 
Hmm. Let me get one question here real quick that we can close out. San Rick, where can I buy some water gel crystals? So I have two suppliers that I use, watergelcrystals.com. They sell a specific insect feeder water gel crystal. And then um, Waterzorb. There is a waterzorb.com, but that's not the one. I want to say it's like waterzorb.com shopify.com or my shopify.com i will respond to that comment with the link of the one that i use once we're done here i don't have it handy with me unfortunately but those are the two that i get them from they sell them in small quantities you can get them in much smaller quantities i buy 50 pound bags because we're using a ton of it here but they've got smaller quantities and both have been very good from a both a cost perspective as well as a customer service perspective so good stuff there all right so let's look at lynn i tease you by seeing your comment and then i i skipped right over so lynn what is the finest sifter you use? I found too much makes it through the 130th. I have a handheld with fine, finer mesh I use to re-sift the frass and collect. Oh man, collect what I call reclaim brand. Yeah, I place in the youngest trays because it always has extremely young larva. Okay. All right, so what's the finest sifter I use? I use the 130th mesh. I tried a 150th and it just took forever right, because it's a smaller mesh, it just takes takes more time. And what I found is that there was actually frass that didn't make it through that 150th mesh. And so the 130th mesh works really well for me. I tend to wait until that, until the bran in the bin is all gone. And then I will harvest that bin. So I don't have that issue of having some of the wheat bran potentially get through that 130th mesh sifter. Um, and if you wait until towards the end of that, or, or at, what am I trying to say? <clears throat> if you uh, feed the bran, the smaller pieces are more likely going to get eaten first because they're easier to, to for a mandible to get on. And so if you do feed bran and then you need to, to sift, give them a little bit of time to, to chew through it and hopefully get all the smaller. It just it wasn't worth it for me from a time perspective to do the 150th. But that's because we waited, you know, we always wait until the brand's gone to then sift the, the frass. It also depends on what your end goal is. If you're going to use that frass for yourself, 130th is perfectly fine. You might get a little bit of substrate in there, but it's not the end of the world. Um, it's going to be faster and more efficient from a time perspective. If you're if you are selling that frass, then you want to put things in place to to make sure that you're not putting wheat bran or substrate, whatever it is, into the the end component. So it, that's what we do here is we just wait till that bin is empty basically, and then we'll we'll go ahead and sift and get the frass out of it. Ta -ta -ta. What is a regular size mealworm? Harvestable size for me is three quarters of an inch to an inch. They will get bigger than an inch. Those I tend to keep as the next. I'm having a hard time today with words. It's been a long week already. The larger ones that end up with the pupa for me, those are the ones that I keep back for the colony to keep the colony going. So the, the mealworms that I sell are mediums. Is what, what they're listed as, three quarters of an inch on average. Sometimes they'll go a little bit higher than that. But it varies. And so based on the seller, the seller is going to tell you, here is, you know, live mealworms, here's what they are. Hopefully they're telling you what the average size is or giving you some idea of what it is so that you know what, what you're getting. Um, and what should be happening is getting them weighed by weight. So you're still getting, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, whatever it is. You're getting that amount, that quantity. You might have different volume though, right? Might weigh more or less depending on what size you're getting. Da, da, da. Yeah, it's like they're growing bigger if you have more beetles than mealworms. Something about hormones from the beetle. Like if you have beetles in with the mealworms somehow? Is that what you mean, Yasek? Hmm, that's interesting. Whoever discovered using a vibration exercise machine is brilliant. I saw it from Max. So big kudos to, to Max, the admin and creator of the Facebook group. He he was using I'm trying to remember. He did a video tour. It's still posted in the in the co-op group somewhere. He did a video tour and showed his entire operation. And at the time, he's moved into a, a bigger building since then. But he had a room with a bunch of those exercise machines. There's different variations of it. He had a bunch of the like the ones you that you can stand on and have a display. It was for like a gym and and everything. He had a bunch of those all set up. And just going and they were he was cranking through sifting stuff and so that's that's where the idea came from that's where i saw it first <coughs> excuse me we'll edit that out in the in the end result i doubt facebook will edit it out but i'll try trina finest frass or finest sifter i use 140th you can get it on amazon frass goes through it very well it's worth a shot i, I went from 130th to one 
50th. I didn't try the 140th though. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. When I wait too, there's been a, yeah, there's been a couple handfuls after sifting several shades. It, it happens. It happens. Yes, if you have 100 beetles and two mealworms, they don't pupate, only grow. Interesting. So lower, lower quantity mealworms, and maybe having some beetles in there with them will get you larger mealworms. That's an interesting test. Somebody should do that. I can't right now. I don't have any trays. I'm struggling to get trays in order to do beetle swap for this week. We've gone through the roof from a production perspective, so I'm struggling right now. I saw Max's video. I didn't know he originated it. Kudos to Max. Yep, yep. He, I think several of his actually had Velcro, I think is what he put on his. I used bungee cords to strap mine. Um, I couldn't find a Velcro fast enough, and so I went with bungee cords, and I've been doing that ever since. So that's what we've got. Great questions, guys. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to... There's a pause in the comments. If if anybody has thrown in a comment that I haven't integrated into some sort of response here, please send me a message and let me know or tag me in it because sometimes I don't get to see them all. All right. Do a quick battery check because my battery was acting funny earlier today. 2.30. Halfway through. Time check. Halfway through. Nathan, hey, good to see you. How do I keep my mealworms from pupating too early? The age-old question, right? So one of the ways you can do it is with chemicals. We talked about the juvenile hormone early on. That will delay them from pupating, but that, I have no idea what the longer-term repercussions of that are. I know that if you apply that hormone, you'll have problems with them pupating later if you want them to. So one of the ways that I do this from a more like natural perspective or at least non-chemical is cold storage so if you put mealworms in cold storage they are less likely to pupate they still will pupate but not in the same quantities i mean you'll get excuse me you'll get maybe you know 10 instead of 100 or 500 in a bin of mealworms and so cold storage is a really good way to do that that will also impact their ability to pupate from a timeline perspective so what I mean by that is if you've got mealworms in a tray, you put them in cold storage, and then you take them out of that cold storage, what I found is that it takes them longer to pupate. They still will, but if you need pupa and you're trying to get them from cold stored mealworms, it's going to take them a little bit longer. I'm not exactly sure why. You know, they've it seems like it's days difference where they'll they'll be cold they'll get taken out of cold storage and instead of just starting to pupate and go bonkers it's several days before they kind of get going and get get into it so uh, they're warmed up within you know a couple hours coming out of the fridge so it's not that they're still cold for whatever reason there's something happening there that slows them down just a little bit Ta -ta -ta. that was a good question nathan thank you for joining i appreciate it Trina, I can't find the 140th. Trina, if you if you have a link or something, throw that out there. I'll try to do some digging as well and respond to that. Sue, I'm trying to understand how two mealworms can survive in a bin with 100, but keep them well fed and maybe separate them. Like what if you put, Sue, what if you put the beetles in like a mesh, mesh enclosure or something where they couldn't get out, but they were still able to spread their, their pheromones? Mother Caitlin, I used used to put the bucket I was using into a crate and used a sawzall without a blade in the space for vibration. Yes, yes, that's an awesome idea. I don't have a sawzall, or I would show you guys, give you a little visual demonstration of what Caitlin described there. But that's a a good way as well. Anything that gets you some some vibration, some movement back and forth, and you can build a machine that can sift things. Uh, you add that movement. You know, it's it's the bucket sifters, right? So you get those bucket sifters, you put it on a five gallon bucket, and if you just sit it there, it's not gonna do very much, right? It'll, they'll eventually start moving around and, and sifting, but it's gonna take forever. So if you add some movement to that, shake it around, it goes. Well, that gets a little old after you have to do it for you know hours at a time. So adding that vibration in, whether it's the vibration plate, the Sawzall, if you have some kind of motor that you can safely configure to, to do the, the job, that a little bit of movement. It doesn't have to be a lot. You don't need to make an earthquake. You just got to make a little bit of movement, and uh, it'll definitely speed up that process. Those are, how do I keep my members from pupating? Keep them hungry, feed them every 20 days. Interesting. So if they're kept hungry, so that feels the opposite of what I would think, right? Because mealworms will pupate when they get stressed, won't they? 
So if you don't give them food, aren't they going to stress? Or be stressed? Although, so let's pretend you're out in nature, right? You're out in nature and you don't have a food source. Does it make sense for you to pupate and then emerge as a beetle and not have anything to eat? Or have any moisture? Mmm, we're gonna have to play with that, Velazar. I like that. That's interesting. Keep them hungry. That's worth a shot, Nathan. I'm not worried about timelines. I just want bigger, mature mealworms themselves. Why? Why? Why do you need bigger? What's What's the draw to bigger? Just curious. I've always wanted to make it one of these, but always was working. Yeah, I. I'm not saying anything's wrong with trying to get bigger. I'm just curious why. Why that's needed. I think it's an animal. No food. Way to, no way to make babies. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, from, from a bigger mealworm perspective, I, I've had people who... So Max has extremely large mealworms. He doesn't use chemicals. He's just running his farm the way he's running it. And he has mealworms that are pretty large. Um, and so if somebody's bought from Max and then they buy from me, there is the potential they'll come to me and say, hey, these aren't very big. What's going on? And they're just the size that I sell. Three quarters of an inch is the, the average size. And that's what I can naturally get here without too much, you know, without the chemical additions or without any sort of major process changes that I just don't know yet. If anybody has any tricks, this, this no feeding thing might be interesting. We'll have to test that out. So love it. I'm going to take a, there's a pause in the comments here. I'm going to take a drink. Halfway done for the day. Oh, man. Oh, so what are some good things that happened to you guys this week? It's been a long week for me. I'm exhausted. But I sold some frass, so that's good. Packaged that up today. Getting that shipped out tomorrow. And we did mealworm harvest yesterday. We got 200, 264,000 harvested yesterday. I think that was a record. I have to go back and look. That was a one-time record that Ben did. Lynn, how do you know when to harvest your mealworms? That's a good question. So honestly, it depends on what your goals are. And, and that sounds like a, a rinse repeat response, but let me give you some context. So if you have an all-in-one system and you're raising mealworms for uh, you know, a handful of reptiles, you don't have to harvest. You can just leave them in a container and let them go. Now, a lot of folks are going to say, oh, my gosh, don't combine. No, don't do that. No, no, no. They're going to cannibalize. They will. But if your goal is to raise enough mealworms to feed a handful of reptiles, a single enclosure is just fine. If you're raising them from a colony perspective to you know, continue raising your numbers or continue getting larger numbers and you want to harvest them, you're just going to need to look at, oh, here we go. My goal is to be able to harvest before they begin pupating. So that's going to vary based on you know, your environment and what you're doing. Um, and, you know, like, for example, if, if Velazar is onto something with holding back feed and then they won't pupate, then you might want to, you know, towards the end of end, when the mealworms are getting larger, you might want to not feed them and see if that helps extend and get larger mealworms um, to, to then harvest. What we're doing when we know it's time is we're just looking in the in the bins and seeing what it's what they look like. And so let's go let's go into the farm and and take a quick look there. So there's a bunch of other questions here, guys, and we'll get to those. Let me turn you around though, and we'll head into head into the farm here. Da da da. Let's go take a look at some of the bins. Oh, the light was already on. Look at that. So these, let me back up and give you some context here and turn the fan off just to reduce some noise here. All right. So these two rows and this one were all harvested yesterday and the tray count was reduced because we were able to consolidate trays and we pulled out all these guys for harvested worms. And so as we go down the line here, this one is, is younger than this guy, younger, young, every, every week we go down, right? And so when you look into these trays, you can see these are the ones that were harvested yesterday and put back in here. And they just got some water gel crystals today, so that's what, that's what these are. But I can look at these and I can just tell these aren't ready. They're not big enough. You've got some in here that are, that are about that size. That's getting close to three quarters of an inch, but just visually, 
because we're in, we're in here all the time, I can look at these and tell you they're not ready. Also, there's a ton of bran in here, right? Because we literally just made this bin. So if we go look at some older trays, let's take a look at this tray here. And you can see there's no bran in here, right? These guys have eaten through what they have. They got some water gel crystals, but they look decent size. These guys might get some more brand before they get harvested, but I'm going to look, I'll look at all of the the trays here just to get an idea of what's going on with them. And because they're so low on wheat bran, oh, get back into focus there. Because they're so low on wheat bran, they might get a, a bit of more, bit more wheat bran to last them, you know, another few days to grow. Or let's see, today's Wednesday. We might harvest these Thursday or Friday and it might just take them a little bit longer. And as we go down, let's look at some younger trays. Let me get the exoskeletons out of the way. There we go. You can tell these guys are younger, right? They're much smaller. So the smaller ones are easy to tell. And you can see the frass and brand mixture in here as they as they go. But as we look at the at this, you know, one week older, there's not a lot of brain in there but there's some larger mealworms every now and then. And so we will probably harvest these guys this week and it'll be a, a lower harvest than some of the older trays. But I don't want pupa in here and we can get the frass, get them, some, get them recounted, make sure they're in the good quantities that we need in a tray and away we go. Uh, let me take a quick look at this while I scroll through and look at some some comments here. That is a uh, it's a bone off of something. I'm trying to remember what it was. They're hollowing out the inside. Da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Da -da. Sand. What size mesh should I buy for my first three sifters? You want the 1 30th mesh. So let's take a look at what that is. That's this guy right here. 1 30th mesh. And what I mean by 1 30th is they will all have these sizes on them. GP2-130. So this is a 1 30th mesh. This is what, what is commonly used for sifting the frass. Then let's take a walk over here to the other sizes. Let me see what, what we got here. Mm, oh, there's the 150th that I got and don't use. No, not these guys. Where did they go? They should be on that guy, so now I have to locate them. Oh, there's one of them. Yes. There we go. So this guy, it's wearing off a little bit, but this is the 1 8 inch. So GP2 again, but 1 8 inch mesh. The 1 8 and the 1 30th will get you, what the 1 8 will stop is it's gonna let the mealworms through that aren't, aren't big enough yet, and then it's gonna hold pupa, beetles, and the larger worms. Then what'll happen, sorry, it'll let the, the smaller worms through, right? Then this guy is going to let the frass go through and it's going to collect all those younger worms. Now what, what I'm doing here is I'll take these younger worms and I put them through another sift. And so I'll put them through a 1 8 inch mesh here and then they go through a medium mesh and get, the small ones get collected. And uh, I need to go back and find I, I did find the size of this mesh, guys, so I have to go back and re-find it because I didn't write it down, but I, I lost the size of this, but I found it back. So I'm going to get that, and I will comment what that size is. This is what collects the harvestable size for me. So anything that stays in here is going to be put into the inventory for sales, and then all the smaller stuff comes down here and gets put back into the colony. So I, I use the 1 8 and the 1 30th mesh. Those are the two that, that I've settled on. This other one here is simply a, a holder. And so this is the, I bought the, the uh, I think it was a, like a five, three to five sifter set a long time ago, back when I didn't know very much. And what I found is that this larger one is 
not usable for anything from a mealworm sifting perspective. You know, it's it, it can obviously grab giant things if you need to sift out bigger things. But what I ended up doing was securing it to my, my shaker here so that I had a convenient place to just kind of put these guys, let them sit, let them go. And so this guy is just, just a holder, really. So those are the two sizes that, uh, that I'm using, Sam. I'm going to pan around just a little bit while I look at some more of these comments, guys. I always wanted to make it to one of these, but always was working. Nathan, I am, I'm glad you made it. I'm trying to do these at different days and times, so mixing it up a little bit, I know that makes it a little less easy for folks to schedule, you know, make it a repeatable thing, but gives folks an opportunity. Da -da -da. Some of those are really good size, and then some people are really small. Yeah. Nathan, that, I mean, it happens. So if we take a look in here, you can actually see like, here's some pretty small beetles. And what's happening is as these mealworms get stressed, they're going to pupate. And so what, what could be happening is, and this is where I'm really curious about the no food thing from Velazar, is my, my thought and what I've seen is that when they don't have any food, they're going to pupate and they'll be small. So maybe it's lack of moisture that's doing that. I'm, I'll have to test some more, but you can get small pupa because some mealworms are just gonna do that. And it's just kind of the, the way it is, unfortunately, unless you wanna get very particular about, you know, sizes, quantity, within a bin, swapping consistently, having a very you know, perfect environment condition basically so that you get repeatable, consistent results constantly. That's a very difficult thing to do. Very difficult. Da -da. Man, the scrolling on Facebook is just awful. That's all I'm doing is raising a handful for leopard geckos. Yep, yep. Da -da. Trina, thank you for the, the info there. Appreciate it. And the link. Oh, winner, winner. Okay. Yasek has a comment. I'll tell you the second way size had approximately 20 Mario beetles by accident. Mealworm beetle come. A couple of them were Mario's, but I'm getting large mealworms twice as normal. I don't see any more you know, small rooms are faster and darker, but all are cool color. Okay. Ah. If I'm not quick enough, smaller mealworms will hide between the mesh and the edge of the green bucket sifter. I haven't I haven't had that issue, but I think I know what you're talking about. Like if you look in if you look in the and this is just the manufacturing, I mean these aren't made specific for mealworms, right? And so this crack here, like these are soil soil classifiers is the technical name, I think, right? And so this crack here is perfect for a mealworm to jump into and start playing in, right? And so they'll get in there and hide and cause a little, cause a little kerfluffle. But for the most part, these are really well built. Like this thing is, has stood up for years at this point. It's, it's doing well, I like them. All right, so the saga of jungle jumbo worms and pupa continues. First beetles appeared yesterday, seemed to be pretty normal size. A couple died and were entirely jet black. Very strange looking compared to the usual pupas that crash. Oh, interesting. Daniel, I would expect that freshly hatched beetles would be starved for moisture, but they seem to ignore carrots while the older beetles swarm them. Do you see similar behavior? I think that I have. I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember. Let's. Sorry, I'm moving around a little bit too fast. Let me slow down. What I think is happening is here's some hatching. Once they've gone through the process of transitioning into a beetle, they're going to need some rest and relaxation, and then they'll hydrate really well. So they'll, they'll still come to moisture, but not as readily. And I think it's probably just because they've transitioned. They're just, just getting into 
the world as a beetle, and it's just going to take a little bit. Nathan, you have a business site. I do, MidwestMealworms.com. I've got that that website, and then I do, obviously, the Facebook stuff here. I'm on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, etc. So I'm, I'm all over the place. No, they hide between the mesh and the plastic. Oh. Interesting. I wonder if... Between the mesh and the plastic? Oh, like, in... Maybe you mean in here. And they can get caught in there. Yeah, it happens. There's some little babies in there. Running around. Alright. Okay, I need to do a quick time check. 2.52, so we've got eight minutes left. I do need to run at the top of the hour. I apologize if I missed anybody's questions. Keep them coming and uh, around the edge. Well, dang, I just keep getting it wrong. I haven't noticed them sticking anywhere. I, I wonder if there's different manufacturers of these things. Yeah, I wonder if... I'll, I'll have to go back and look and see if the if the link is still active I think I want to say I got these off Amazon but I I'll go back and look at that and see if I can find who who built these because they've lasted forever I have not had to buy new ones the only buying I did was I bought the five set I think originally and then I did buy the uh, what was it the 150th is it this guy no that's another 130th I did for a backup the 150th just to do some testing on putting frass through it and seeing what happened and it just took forever from a, a labor perspective it was not worth the hours added hours to the harvesting and sifting process to to go through that so gerard good evening justin good evening to you do you spray your pupa saw the paper towel probably for moisture control i do spray the pupa i just started that so we're going to see jury's out right now on how that's going to going to work but what i have started doing recently so you can actually see my setup here it's temporary because i just started doing this what was it last week or the week before so my intent is to put put this guy this is a 55 gallon food grade drum i'm going to put that on wheels and then i'm going to build a rack on top to hold the extra all the hose i mean that's ridiculous when we're here trying to work. So I did start using that recently to spray the two week old plus mealworms until they get to the point where they're big enough for me to feed them water gel crystals or regular feed. Sorry, excuse me, regular moisture. So like these guys here, this bin actually got sprayed because I ran out of water gel crystals today. I got the big ones and got a few rows in and then wasn't able to get these guys, so I gave them a quick drink via the the spraying. I don't like to do that though, because as you can see on the other side, um, let me see if I can get my hand in here. You can see the exoskeletons here that got blown on the side. All this is going to do is continue to build up. So I do this very sparingly because over time this stuff will collect here, and then it's just a a highway for the mealworms to go up and climb out, right? So we're spraying the younger bins because there aren't any exoskeletons, right? Like here's a younger bin here. It got sprayed just a little while ago. No exoskeletons, so less, less highway building. And then what I started doing, because it's right here, is I am also giving these a light mist, light little spray, just to give them a little bit of hydration, hopefully to increase the, the humidity in these trays I'm running at 70% right now for, the, for the, the room here, but giving them a little bit extra to see if that helps with some of the die-off I've been experiencing with my pupa. So as that comes to fruition, if it helps or hurts, I'll let everybody know and we'll see what happens. Great question, sir. Thank you. Nathan, thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Hope to see you again. All right. Ta -ta -ta. Do we get a sifting tutorial? Absolutely. I can definitely do that. I might have some already posted. I'll go and, and check there. If not, I'll get to get something out there. Da, da, da. I see that some of my is they're going in the smaller mesh when mealworms are smaller. Yeah, I wonder if I wonder if some caulk is is needed there. 
I'd be really curious, Lynn, to see like a picture of that, right? So we could we could do some comparisons and build build some solutions here for folks if depending on who the manufacturer was or what's happened, right? If we can build a solution for, you know, if caulking works or, you know, some other other option maybe. I like that. We're gonna beat a silicone, here we go, Invictus, see the bead of silicone around the edges of my sifters to fill the gap problem. Yep, awesome. All right. Be careful with wet napkins. Yes, so I, I am not, like these were sprayed. You can still see there's moisture on the side here. You can still see it, but it was very light and it's already, already almost dry. And this was like two and a half, three hours ago. So very minimal spraying. You do want to be careful with that to make sure you're not going to introduce mold or just suffocate everything underneath there. Hello, beetles. Sorry to bother you. Just suffocate everything underneath there. So, all right. Well, we've got three minutes till the top of the hour. I'm gonna go, oh, Lynn, thank you. That's awesome, love it, love it. All right, if there is anything I did not answer and some of the things that I owe you guys, Sam, I know I owe you something, and one of those, thank you for your time, effort, and great information. Yes, thank you, thank you for joining. I always enjoy doing this. I felt a little off today, it's been a, a rough week but uh, thank you guys for joining thank you for all the really good questions i'll get answers posted and this will post uh, the recording will post to the group once facebook deems everything okay and appropriate and i'll get another one of these scheduled for next week thank you all very much for uh, for joining contributing and uh, helping us learn how to do this better I'll turn that around thank you very much have a great afternoon evening morning wherever you're at i'll see you next time